Thank you so much, um, Emma. That was really a kind introduction. I'm, I'm not going to be talking about Greenland a lot today because I just got here, right? And I'm going to be talking about places elsewhere in the world that I've worked and how I think it might be relevant. And I'll start. Um, thank you for this wonderful opportunity to speak to you about anthropological work I've done in other parts of the world, which I hope and think may be relevant and perhaps useful to researchers, both students and faculty here at the University of Greenland. I'm here because the Arctic Science Program, Social Science Program, at the National Science Foundation in the United States thought that questions that I had presented to them were worthwhile to explore with some preliminary funding. Those ideas concern the future trajectory of agriculture in southern Greenland in light of the work I've done elsewhere. It's my hope that the people attending this presentation and others here at the university or in other organizations in Greenland will find these ideas and experiences of utility. I first want to preface the discussion of my previous work with a few comments about why I became and have been interested in Greenland and its sociocultural, economic, and political histories uh, for a long time. I was a college student at the University of Copenhagen during the late 1970s. And during my year living in that city, frequently discussed politics with Danish college and high school students. My studies took place just three years after the end of the Vietnam War. And many Danish young people had a very negative opinion about both US foreign policy, as well as about the racism that African American and Native American people experienced in the United States. I agreed with their criticisms of the US very strongly. But while I knew nothing about Greenland as a 20 year old, one, uh, I asked my Danish friends whether da Greenland was a Danish colony. And this brought a very strong response and sometimes ended conversations very quickly. That, of course, made me much more curious to find out more. At the University of Copenhagen, I took mythology classes about Scandinavia and archaeology classes uh, about Iron Age and Viking Age uh, Denmark and Scandinavia. And in this way, I learned a certain amount, a certain degree, a certain limited part of Greenland's history. history. <clears throat> And of course, I met Greenlanders with whom I had conversations that made me even more curious. So I continued to read about Greenland during the next four decades as I became an anthropologist who worked with indigenous communities in Central, South, and North America. And as I returned to Denmark and other Scandinavian countries as part of various research projects in those years, I closely followed the establishment of home rule in Greenland in 1979 and more closely followed the creation of the self-rule government in 2008 and 2009, as this country moved, it would seem, towards full independence. In short, the deeper reason why I'm here is that I have cared for a long time about what happens here and what will happen here. And of course, I'm still very new to an intensive study of almost every aspect of Greenland's history and society. Before I begin my excursion into my previous work, I want to quote a section from an historically based novel about 18th century colonial Greenland. And I'm sure many of you know this novel. Um, and I acknowledge that sometimes, you know, a novel can help you to think about another place and, and, and congeal a broad range of questions uh, about that place. Uh, I hope the, the novel is accurate, not a, not a, a misrepresentation. This is the novel in the, in the English translation by the Danish Norwegian author Kim Lane, I guess that's how it's pronounced, um, the prophet of the eternal fjord. Given questions about the future of farming, I hope it's clear why I'm reading these lines. So this is from the novel. Some two years following her arrival in Greenland, Haldora Kragsted decides she will have a vegetable garden. She has made mention of it to her husband before, only to have him laugh incredulously. A vegetable garden? Why not a wheat field or an apple orchard? Glancing up at her, he thought better of his facetiousness. My dear, a vegetable garden? Come, let me show you something. He took her outside, made her wait in front of the house, and fetched a spade from the warehouse. He handed it to her. What am I to do with it, she asked. Dig a hole, said Kragsted, for your vegetable garden. He laughed. Don't look so glum. Let me. <laughs> 
He lifted the spade and thrust it down into the ground. A metallic, metallic clatter sounded, whereupon he stepped up to the edge of the blade and pressed it down with the full weight of his body. It sank a couple of inches. Then he angled it upward, wrenched away a small edge of peat, and thrust the, the spade into the ground once more. And the same occurred. You see, he said, stepping back. Stones, she said. No, not stones. Stone, the bedrock of Greenland. How will you bring forth a vegetable garden in a land where one can hardly bury a body? The wilderness should be cultivated, she said. Isn't that what we're doing here? We? We, the white people. Is that not the purpose of all this? She nodded her head in the direction of the warehouses. Not even white people have solved the problem of cultivating rock, he said. Then we must order some good Danish soil, said the madam. Have you lost your senses, her husband spluttered. That's the end of that section. In this little dramatic scene, Lyne's vignette conjures questions about growing crops in Greenland, and therefore about food, of landscape, and consequently the work of colonialism, and of course race and indigeneity, topics which will recur in the context of the work I have been doing in locations from Nicaragua to Colombia and Ecuador, from California to Palestine, and in classrooms and field schools at the University of New Mexico. I apologize in advance for the many changes of scene and context in what follows, but I hope the threads of connection will become clear and useful. Regarding my work in Nicaragua, where I carried out dissertation fieldwork in the mid-1980s and additional fieldwork in the 1990s, both of which formed the basis of my first book, uh, I would like to make two observations. First, in very general terms, by working in Nicaragua at that time, my outlook on society and culture was from the first shaped by the experience of a country undergoing substantial political and economic changes, changes associated with the revolutionary transformation that was being attempted at that time. In other words, I have been an anthropologist who focuses upon change rather than the presumption of continuity or stasis or, in short, tradition, which many have accused anthropology of being obsessed with. In that light, working in Nicaragua, and I'll show you if I can, there's Central America and Nicaragua in the middle of Central America, and then we don't have a laser pointer, do we? Maybe, maybe so. I should have asked that beforehand. Well, maybe not. It's OK. Unless this is, no. It's good. Um, if you look at uh, the map of Nicaragua and you see the city of, oh, yay. <laughs> OK, thanks. Thanks, Eva. There's the capital city of Managua. And this is the area where I did some of my research around the city of Masaya, where I lived. And then I also did some research in this town, these two towns up here. Um, working in Nicaragua also laid the basis for my views about indigenous identities and indigeneity. The communities where I spent most of my time conducting research were comprised of people who made pottery and whose ancestors had made pottery for a very long time uh, before the Spanish ever got there. While in the 1980s, the people in these villages did not really talk very much about being indigenous people, by the 1990s, they had come to understand their identities as indigenous in far more explicit terms. In thinking about those changes in my first book, I discussed how anthropologists had for many years reinforced and relied upon romanticized ideas of indigenous cultures. Characterizing indigenous identities as determined by fixed cultural traits like language and worldview and rituals and social organization and clothing and other bodily ornamentation. In the 1990s, like many other people who were criticizing this legacy, I advanced a new analysis and a new kind of representation of indigenous peoples. I identified these two different positions within the anthropological literature as, on the one hand, 
the cultural survival school, and on the other hand, the ethnicity as resistance school. The cultural survival school, with its origins in people like Franz Boas in the United States and uh, Alfred Kroeber and British structural functionalism, is characterized by a kind of essentialist view of indigenous culture. Anthropologists who work this approach have assumed that indigenous peoples need to preserve their essential traits in order to culturally survive. In contrast, the resistance school that I advanced, and others as well, hinges upon a more fluid concept of identity amongst indigenous peoples in Latin America, arguing that being indigenous may not always maintain connections to pre-context social and cultural forms, but by contrast, that identity is continuously reformulating in relation to changing sociocultural dynamics in, in the whole society. I included that the discourses about indigenous identities in Latin America, both amongst the intellectuals uh, in indigenous communities and leaders and anthropologists too, have been and are still moving away from essentialist approaches that emphasized fixed ethnic markers, like the ones I said, like dress and clothing and, and, and ritual and, and so on. And these observations may have some relevance here in Greenland as well. So there's the book. Now we're going to move to Colombia. In Colombia, I worked with indigenous communities, both self-identified and as identified by outsiders in their own countries and by anthropologists whose ways of life and understandings of the world and their place in it are largely shaped by farming domesticated plants. Fieldwork with indigenous NASA communities in Colombia was made possible by my employment in an institution that has been part of the global green revolution. So let me just uh, orient here. Colombia, there's the edge of C Central America, right? Panama. Colombia is a really big country, right? It's much, much bigger than Central America. And uh, there's the capital, Bogota. Um, I lived in the city of Cali here. And the work I did with the NASA communities, uh, the indigenous group, is down uh, in this province, Cauca province here. So this is about a two and a half hour drive from the city of Cali to the area where I worked. And um, Colombia is geographically a really complicated place. There's uh, the Andes Mountains here at the Ecuadorian border split into three chains. So there's a western chain, a central chain, and an eastern chain. And so the city of Cali is between the western and the central. And the city of Popayan here and, and all of these NASA communities are in the mountains of the central cordillera or central mountain chain. And we can talk some more about that. But first I want to say, um, as I said, I, I, I had I worked at, a, at an institution of the Global Green Revolution. The Green Revolution, as I'm sure many of you are well aware, was the product of intensive research carried out by a number of high-level research institutions created by something called the Consultative Group on International Agricultural Research, or CGIAR, which was established in the early 1960s by the United States what was then the European Economic Community, now is the European Union, Japan, Canada, the largest corporations in the world, and a number of very wealthy foundations, especially the Rockefeller Foundation. And while this may sound like science fiction to younger people, this changed the world forever, the Green Revolution. And the world will never be the same again. Um, these powerful states and institutions acted upon their conclusion that the world was facing a Malthusian crisis, right? Thomas Malthus, the old English economist, right, who believed that the rate of growth of human population would outstrip the capacity of human beings to produce food, leading to massive famines and breakdown of, um, uh, of, uh, of the social order, right? Uh, and of course, at this time, in the late 1950s and early 60s, that Malthusian anxiety, if you will, 
was accompanied by the anxiety about communism, right? Because 1949, the Chinese Revolution, 1961, the Cuban Revolution. So in the United States and the European community and all of these different places and certainly in the corporate world and the world of wealthy foundations, there was this sense that if society was going to confront that kind of crisis, that would fuel the spread of communist regimes. Um, and so their solution to this Malthusian crisis they thought was coming, and which they could have been very well correct about, was to create these institutions. In short order, uh, these institutions the CG of the CGIAR had developed varieties of major staple crops, such as rice, potatoes, legumes, and many others that, if you give them enough water and fertilizer, produce twice and three times as much product in the same area as older varieties. And that's why the world feeds itself today. I mean, that's, that's it, is the Green Revolution created these varieties that enable countries like China and India and the Philippines and Nigeria and Mexico and Peru and all of these countries to produce enough food because the varieties were vastly improved by bringing together the most advanced scientists in soil science, in plant breeding, in agronomy, in uh, entomology, uh, economists, sociologists, bringing them all together, giving them a lot of money and very advanced laboratory facilities, and they created these varieties. I was sent to Colombia to work with the Centro Internacional de Agricultura Tropical, which means the International Center for Tropical Agriculture, which is abbreviated to CIAT uh, in Spanish. And I began working with the unit that deals with seeds and seed treatments at CIAT. The principal directive I received from my supervisors was that I should try to understand why farmers who only own small parcels of land, so-called small farmers, were not adapting and adopting new technologies for preserving viable seeds or new crop varieties that were being bred in the laboratories of that organization. And then I was instructed to try to figure out how to get those people to participate in experiments with these technologies and seed varieties. I worked closely with the people who were developing new kinds of beans, who were also interested in these issues, and were willing to supply me with new bean varieties if I could find farmers who were willing to try them out. Um, so that was all a little bit to the north of the area where I ended up working uh, with uh, indigenous NASA farmers. Uh, like, I, like I just said, the, uh, many of the farms that the bean program was, was uh, experimenting on were in those northern areas of that Cauca province. And the people that they were working with were not indigenous people. They were what in Latin America we call mestizos, which means people who speak Spanish, who sometimes have some indigenous ancestry, but no longer have a connection to their indigenous uh, uh, background. They see themselves as Spanish-speaking uh, Colombians, in, this, in the case of Colombia. Um, and these people generally own very small parcels of land, and these were the people who were not willing to try out the new green varieties. Um, and that probably was for a couple of reasons. Um, for one thing, the farmers in this region were also increasingly growing coca, right? Which is the uh, plant that cocaine is derived from. And that was a much more lucrative crop for them to grow. And so uh, that was more of their interest. But also, I would say that they were unwilling to experiment with new crop varieties or new technologies because it created an unacceptable risk. If you're a farmer and you have a piece of land, say, the size of this room, or twice the size of this room, or four times the size of this room, and you try out a new crop variety, and that crop variety does not work out for you, right? It doesn't produce food. It dies because there's not enough rain. It dies because there's too much rain. It dies because it's windy. For some reason, it doesn't work out. Well, you're out of luck, right? Because you pinned all your hopes on that crop variety. So I was um, arguing to the scientists that the reason why people weren't trying out their new technologies and their new, um, their new seed technologies 
uh, varieties was because the risks were unacceptable. Before I had begun working at SIAT, I had independently established a relationship with a particular NASA community, and that NASA community, right, as I said, is, is up in here, and it's called Pitayo. Uh, Pitayo is a, a resguardo, which in Colombia means it's an indigenous territory that was officially deeded to the community during the Spanish colonial period. And um, I could explain that further, but, but let's just leave it at that for the moment. Um, resguardos in Colombia's Andean region typically have two features that are very unique and interesting. One is, hi, <laughs> one is the land is owned communally, right? There's no individual ownership of land, which I understand is the same in, in Greenland as well, right? And the other practice that's really important is that there's this custom of what's called the minga, which is a collective labor practice. So if a road needs to be built, a school needs to be built, some other activity for the whole community that would benefit the whole community, you bring together people from different families and they have a minga and that they work together for that day or that couple of days and they accomplish a task that has a, um, a collective purpose. So you've got communal land and collective labor. And the Nasa people of Pitayo had, had both of these characteristics. Soon after arriving at SIAT and after inspecting what I considered now clearly the lackluster projects amongst the mestizo farmers, I met with the Indigenous Community Council, or Cabildo, of this resguardo and explained to the members the seed pre preservation technologies and the new bean varieties that I could make available to them for the purposes of doing controlled scientific experiments. I told them that we would be able to analyze the chemical content of the soil and the locations where we would conduct experiments, as well as provide access to irrigation equipment to support the experimental crops. The Indigenous Council voted to approve and to work together with me in planning and executing the experiments. And they chose five locations on their resguardo, uh, and they chose the varieties that they wanted to test against the varieties that they already had. So that was the control, right? They had their own varieties, and then they had these new varieties, uh, and they were, they, were, they were testing them against them. And then they also promised to provide the necessary labor to set up and monitor the experiments every week through one of their mingas. And uh, they were very enthused to have the soil tested to find out what was in the soil and what its characteristics were. They also agreed to test the new seed drying and preservation equipment. And my conclusion at that point was that these indigenous practices, communal land and collective labor, far from constituting a sort of dead weight of tradition or some kind of traditional practice from antiquity that was no longer useful, useful actually offered positive assets for agricultural experimentation that considerably reduced the risks undertaken by small farmers such as the mestizo farmers who risked everything. And as I've noted, I think that's why those mestizo farmers were so unwilling to try these new things. Now, at the time that I was figuring this out, I was also confronting the fact that the elite political and economic class that rules Latin American countries such as Colombia tend to denigrate indigenous practices as backwards, right? They tend to characterize indigenous populations as quote unquote resistant to new technology, right? So in Spanish, atrasado, backwards, and resistente a las tecnologías nuevas, resistant to new technologies. North Americans and anthropologists in many cases, by contrast, romanticize indigenous practices as simpler or closer to nature quote unquote, or not market oriented. Neither of these perspectives is accurate and both seriously under underestimate and potentially caricature aspects of native society that are part of those histories. And in this case, their agricultural knowledge and practices. So I think for non-indigenous people, there are many pitfalls to fall into in looking at how and why indigenous peoples do the things that they do.
um, romanticism versus kind of a, a, a racist denigration uh, in the case of Colombia. The NASA community's experiments were highly successful. And although I was obliged to leave Pitayo and all of Colombia at the end of 1989, because after all, it was a very violent year in that country, uh, extremely violent and, and kind of worrisomely violent. Um, and some of the communities that I was driving through were also growing another illicit crop, opium poppies, under the sponsorship of the illicit narcotics industry. That was also a very dangerous thing for me to be there because I kind of stand out, right? Um, you can't really mistake me for a Colombian. Uh, these experiments were sustainable in three ways. And uh, I want to use that word sustainable. It's kind of a fashionable word nowadays, right? Everybody uses the word sustainable. It's a, it's a, it's a buzzword. Uh, at the time, it was not quite as much, right? It was sort of coming into, into vogue. But I'm using the term sustainable in, in a few ways. First of all, the NASA people in Pitayo, um, it, it worked out that two of the new varieties, maybe it was three, two or three, let's say, were actually useful, OK? Uh, and th they, they thought they would try them out. So they, they, they would continue to, to grow them after the, the experiment was over. So they saved the seeds so that they could now grow these new kinds of beans into the future. And there were some benefits from those particular varieties. So that's one way it was sustainable. They, they got some new crop varieties. Second, they also adopted some of the new seed technologies for drying the seeds and preserving them. And they had to utilize them. Uh, and they didn't need any more advice from the, the agronomists from SIA. Uh, and lastly, and perhaps most importantly, the NASA people, the NASA farmers, learned how to design and carry out experiments. And it turned out that when I got there and I first went and met with them, they were actually really interested in this idea. How do you experiment with things? How do you do that? How do you do that in a scientific way? And um, ever since then, they've been doing that. They've been experimenting on a variety of different things, trying organic pesticides, trying different kinds of reforestation, trying different kinds of associations between crops. And so um, far from being resistant to new technologies or resistant to change, that's actually what they wanted to do, right? They wanted to try out new things. They just wanted to figure out how to do it in a rigorous scientific way. All of these conclusions may have relevance for the possibilities, we're discussing the possibilities, for agricultural expansion in southern Greenland, right? It's thinking about people who farm as people who are interested in experimenting with things, thinking about people who farm as interested in, uh, in change, not in always in traditional techniques, but in changes that are useful. And basically, you know, everywhere I've worked with indigenous peoples, I have never found anyone in, resistant to change, per se. What they're resistant to is who gets to control it, right? That's really the issue, is who's in control of the changes, not change itself. Uh, so uh, I would like to uh, think uh, about how agriculture is either already present or can become a factor of identity in southern Greenland. That seems to be a very important question to ask. And uh, of course, emphasizing that farmers, like I said, consistently seek to experiment to improve their yields and to des test different techniques and crops. And that this is all part of being a farmer and having an identity as a farmer. The agricultural research that I carried out with these indigenous communities in Colombia, is it a little warm in here? Does everybody feel warm? OK. Good. Uh, uh, the agricultural research I carried out with indigenous communities in Colombia was never meant and wasn't ever kept separate from an appraisal and analysis of the foods that were produced by farming. Some of the crops grown in Pitayo actually have profound significance for NASA people and how they understand themselves to be NASA, right? Uh, certain crops like potatoes and other root crops that no one in Greenland or in the United States has ever heard of are considered to be sort of emblems of NASA tradition and NASA identity. I took those relationships that I had described in this research as a basis upon which to plan classes at the University of New Mexico. Uh, 
where I teach, classes that focus on food. Um, and all across the United States right now, classes about food are growing in, in popularity. I don't know if you have classes like that here at the University of Greenland, but um, those are very, very popular classes in the United States, and they're, they're growing very quickly. So I'm going to switch scenes now to my home institution. Uh, oh, wait, I was going to show you some farms. Why don't I do that? <laughs> yeah, this is what it looks like. Yeah. So um, these are all cultivated fields. And it's very mountainous. Um, this is about 2,500 meters above, the, above sea level. So even though it's uh, near the equator, really quite close to the equator, the climate is not uh, hot at all. It's actually quite cold up here. And I've even seen it hail, right? So it's, it gets very, very cold. Um, this is one of our experimental fields. Uh, th those are, are, I think, our potato plants. Uh, here's the little village of Pitayo. There's the church and the central plaza and people's houses. That's me when my hair wasn't white yet, long ago. Uh, <laughs> and here are some of the farmers and, and their kids, and we're, we're, we're working on that field. Here are uh, protected areas for, for trying different experimental crops. Uh, using plastic, which, which is an interesting technique and uh, also produces waste, of course. Here are lovely potato plants um, that we grew beans amongst, right? So we would, we would put beans into the potato field in a crop association, which is a technique they use. And uh, this is uh, me and my, my wife and our baby son with our friends who were engaged in this, in this experiment. These are all really dear friends of mine. Uh, this guy in particular is kind of my best friend. So um, now we're going to the University of New Mexico. OK. Uh, this is the library. And it, it doesn't look like other universities in the United States at all. I don't know if you know what like places like Harvard and Yale, those nice East Coast universities, not the University of New Mexico. We have a very different architecture. And of course, it's a very different kind of state, as I'll talk about in in a sec. So in the first class that I ever taught that was aimed at uh, freshmen, right, first year undergraduates, it was entitled Food and Humanity. And I used the focus of food as a means to explore the different subfields of the discipline of anthropology. And I explained this to the students in their, first, in their syllabus as follows. Anthropology, the study of humanity's biological evolution and cultural development offers tools for obtaining a well-rounded and holistic understanding of the many facets of relationship between human beings and the foods they eat. Each of anthropology's subfields provides insightful perspectives on humanity's relationship with food. Physical or biological anthropology offers us ways to investigate what foods were eaten during the millions of years during which our species has been evolving. And what were the changing strategies for obtaining food as a central part of that evolution? Archaeology provides many diverse windows into the historical rise and decline of many kinds of food in many civilizations, and how different food production strategies have played a role in human development. And finally, cultural anthropology, which is what I do, focuses upon how food is produced, prepared, served, consumed, and understood in diverse human cultures in the present. All of these subfields are interested in the issues of nutrition, disease, competition, cooperation among men and women as they relate to the production and consumption of food. And I think this is the syllabus, yeah. So I just put this on so you could see it. <laughs> After teaching this class a few times, I decided to refocus the class. And I wanted to enroll more advanced students in their second and third years with a more specifically oriented curriculum focused upon issues in the state where we live and where we work. New Mexico is one of the three most impoverished states in the United States, as well as, and unfortunately not unrelated to, being a state in which the majority of people are members of minority groups, specifically American Indian tribes and Hispanic communities with very deep historical roots. So in New Mexico, unlike 
what certain politicians have to say in my country, including the president. Uh, Spanish-speaking people got there first, right? And Spanish precedes English, and of course the Native American languages far precede Spanish. So it's not an immigrant issue. Unlike almost everywhere else in the United States, right, where diversity derives from more recent immigration. Uh, and so uh, New Mexico is very different in that way and has a very different feel, right? The diversity is very, very long term. These populations and communities, however, generally suffer from poverty-related health issues that are directly related to health and nutrition, okay? So New Mexico would be also a place where you find a massive number of people with type 2 diabetes from poor diets, a massive number of people with um, uh, uh, high blood pressure, and other conditions that are associated with poor nutrition and uh, or obesity. But at the same time, right, as you might find in any place where uh, poverty is so general, there is also a prevalence of hunger, right? Which is a very curious combination in the United States is the coexistence of, of morbid obesity amongst a significant population and a significant incidence of hunger. So I decided to teach a course called the Anthropology of Hunger in New Mexico. The syllabus for that class elaborated the focus for the students in this way. Food is often described as one of the biological needs that each person must fulfill on a daily basis. While it is certainly true that our bodies have nutritional requirements that must be met to assure our survival and well-being, food is not simply a means to getting the necessary vitamins, minerals, carbohydrates, and proteins into our bodies. Food is defined, shaped, understood, and consumed in profoundly cultural ways. It's not obvious what we consider food and what we consider inedible. And food is never defined, accepted, and eaten just on the basis of what is good for you. Hunger is usually considered the consequence of an absence of food. But if food is defined and shaped and understood and consumed in profoundly cultural ways, hunger must be as well. And the specific manner in which food and hunger are conceptualized are thus new, unique in New Mexico. And then I talk about cultural anthropology as a tool to understand this. Um, this particular class, okay, was unlike conventional introductory uh, cultural anthropology classes. Uh, like a conventional classroom, we had lectures and read textbooks and took tests and wrote papers, but students were also engaged in doing firsthand research about hunger in New Mexico. And in addition, they were required to do some community service that was linked to their research. The class was called service learning because a major part of what students did during the semester was to conduct research and carry out service in a real world community. The class was part of what was called the Hunger Initiative, part of the research service learning program at UNM, an initiative which supported the goal of ending hunger and malnutrition in the state. The community in which the members of the class worked was composed of senior citizens who were living in a senior citizen apartment building. So an apartment building that was, or set of apartments uh, wasn't actually like a high-rise, it was a low-rise apartment uh, complex, uh, exclusively for senior people who had limited incomes and who were only enabled to live there because they had li limited incomes, and who, for that reason, made use of what were called food boxes that were provided by a local food bank. So the food bank would bring to the senior citizens a box of food every week composed of uh, mostly uh, non-perishable items, things in cans or dried foods. Um, in teams of three, students in the class conducted interviews with senior citizens at specific sites, which provided primary data about the foods that the seniors were eating, the foods that they weren't eating, and the foods that they might want to eat but weren't getting. Administrators of the food bank system then used this information to adjust and change the provision of food from the food banks to the underserved population uh, in that place and across the city. So, if agriculture and farming are inseparable, 
from what we might call the food landscape or foodscape, they are also part and parcel of physical landscapes and the historical processes of change, particularly under colonial regimes of power. So I'm going to shift now away from a discussion of, of, of agriculture and food to a discussion of food and landscape and food and, and colonialism. I will now introduce the collaborative research I have uh, done in and with indigenous communities in California and with UNM students in Palestine during two field schools in 2011 and 2015, respectively. So got a map here of California, right, the state. And then this is the Bay Area, right, which is this area here. Uh, so uh, if you're not familiar with California geography, this is where Los Angeles is, and this is where the Bay Area is, so San Francisco at the end of this peninsula, and the city of San Jose here, and then the university city of Berkeley over here. So the vast population of California, which is now, I think, 31 million people, lives from about here down to here along this narrow coastal strip. Um, the transform and, and as, as I'll talk about, this is the area where I've done most of my work uh, with a variety of different tribes. It's in the Bay Area, although I've also worked in the northern part, but we'll get to that. The transformation, oh, I'm sorry. Um, the transformation of foods and how those foods were obtained before European contact was for indigenous communities in California decisively accomplished by the colonial transformation of landscape. California native peoples have lived in and still inhabit a re particularly remarkable area uh, inside the wide arc of terrains that stretches from southeast Alaska down through the coasts of British Columbia, Washington State, and Oregon as far inland as the Sierra Nevada and as far south as the border with Mexico. In this broad region of biologically rich, extremely diverse rainforests, fresh and semi-fresh water estuaries, hilly and mountainous ecotones, riverine habitat, oceanic, uh, oceanic coastline, and other habitats, hunting and gathering peoples developed, uh, developed economically diversified and complex political, social, and economic organization. This organization centered on first a landscape of small and numerous permanent villages featuring clans and lineages that specialized in many kinds of material production. And second of all, a series of semi-permanent resource exploitation sites for hunting and fishing, plant gathering, shellfish collecting, also sprinkled across the different ecological terrains that surrounded the central permanent villages. So say, for example, in the South Bay, where I've done a lot of work, there was a village probably around here, which was a fairly large village, especially for a foraging people, right? People get their food from hunting, gathering wild plants and animals, about maybe as many as 2,000 people. And then their camps, where they um, would go and get different kinds of food, were in a wide surrounding area. So up in these hills, they would hunt deer and other kinds of herbivores. And down in this shoreline, they would collect shellfish. And in this area here, they would hunt other kinds of animals and gather other kinds of foods. In these materially wealthy hunting and gathering societies, a number of advanced aesthetic and artistic technologies and traditions, including wood and stone carving, basket making, two-dimensional iconography, etc developed, many of which have subsequently continued to develop after contact with Europeans. And of course, uh, being that I went to the National Museum of Greenland yesterday, I would say that very similar kinds of characteristics could be said about the hunting and gathering peoples of, of Greenland uh, before contact in developing extremely sophisticated technologies and tools uh, and uh, 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 artistic forms. These characteristic features of California and Pacific Northwest Coast native peoples render inaccurate 
The usual evolutionary schema that categorizes foragers as denizens of primitive, simple band level societies. And unfortunately, that's what students learn in anthropology, right? That foragers are this kind of primitive sort of way of getting food uh, and of living. The generalized mistake of representing foraging peoples as members of an early stage of human development that was subsequently superseded in it, quote unquote advanced societies that moved to agriculture is particularly unsustainable in this area and in Greenland too, I would say. Demographers reliably report, for example, that the area that is now the state of California supported the densest population in pre-contact North America. Right? So compared to any other part of North America where people practiced agriculture, the most people lived here in what's now the state of California. For the 18th century Spaniards, the simultaneous presence of dense human populated landscapes with an astonishing biological diversity that they found in the western coastal regions of North America, a diversity they associated with the concept of wilderness, was impossible to interpret. So I think, you know, I, it's like a science fiction movie where, you know, one civilization can't even see what the other civilization does. I think they looked at California and they were stumped. They thought it was a wilderness, but there were all these people there. But all what the people were doing, hunting and gathering, that's what rich people did back in Europe, right? The king hunted, right? Normal people farmed. So there was a complete incomprehension. Notwithstanding the Spaniards' incomprehension, their campaign to disarticulate native lifeways, which hinged upon making the pre-contact food production and distribution systems no longer possible, was completely effective and enduring. And this is about the landscape transformation that occurred in California. In California, as was the case all over Spanish America, colonial rule was designed to reassemble dispersed native populations into villages and towns from which their labor could be extracted. And if that sounds familiar to people in Greenland, I think it probably is familiar. The spread of agricultural production and ranching in California, where indigenous people got their food from foraging, specifically aimed to resettle native peoples into large communities as a central aspect of the successful colonization of this region. The collapse of native places and geographies in the face of colonization was a complex process and never quite complete. The livestock that the Spaniards brought with them almost immediately began damaging native vegetation upon which the coastal native peoples of California had depended. And an ecological transformation ensued that led to the decline and disappearance of native grasses and the wild herbivores who fed upon them under the impact of cattle ranching. So whether you've been to this part of California or you've seen pictures, you'll often see pictures of the golden hills, right, of the Bay Area or of Los Angeles. All those grasses are not native grasses. They're imported grasses. That's not what it used to look like. Those grasses were brought for cows, right? And by displacing the native grasses, they also got rid of the animals that lived on them, right? The Franciscan priests, who were part of the colonization, colonization uh, effort, suppressed control burns. And burning the uh, vegetation landscape, uh, as many authors have shown, was an especially important technique of native food resource management. Environmental degradation, demographic complosion, and the deterioration of the psychological and cultural environment caused by systematic mistreatment, in the end led the native social structure to erode. Ritual practices and respect for elders and cultural experts deteriorated as natives realized that their old ways provided no protection against disease and mistreatment and had seemingly become irrelevant. This process snowballed. And it might be surmised that the Spanish didn't really know what they were doing. You know, that wasn't necessarily a planned thing what they did. They brought their animals with them. They brought fodder for them. They might not have realized how their actions would unfold. Yet, at the same time, they had created and administered a system of forcible baptism and internment of baptized indigenous men and women in sex-segregated filthy barracks-type quarters that facilitated the spread of disease. 
And these are the famous Spanish missions of California, which if you ever go there, you'll probably see them, right? And they are up and down the coast from, oops, uh, from what's now San Diego, right down here, all the way to Sonoma County up here, a series of missions. And um, some have called them concentration camps. Um, and in my mind, that's not terribly much of an exaggeration. Uh, and the, the, the outcomes were, were, were terrifying. Uh, those who attempted to escape were forcibly recaptured by soldiers and were flogged by the priests. And with the almost complete loss of personal autonomy, the colonized spread, uh, the co co colonies, um, I mean, it, it's not too much to say. They were at least a penal system, okay? The transformation of landscape was thus just as much a profound effect of colonialism as the impact upon the indigenous peoples themselves. The two processes and their effects, as I have implied, were co-determinant and co-created. Agriculture is, in and of itself, one of the most effective and pervasive and enduring forms of landscape transformation. And that is, and would be true, I would argue, even in the absence of climate change, either in its contemporary manifestations and previously in human history. So I think it's very important if we're going to talk about agriculture in Greenland, which I hope I will get to do uh, uh, through the project that I, that I would like to start here and in, in cooperation with students and faculty, uh, is understanding that agriculture is a profound transformation of landscape. And, and uh, my work in California is very uh, instructive in that regard. In California, however, native peoples did not disappear in the face of colonialism, uh, although many white people think they did, right? All over the United States, and unfortunately, often fueled by anthropologists' misconceptions and their own complex relationships to colonial histories, the quote-unquote myth of the vanishing Indian still exerts a powerful pull on non-native imagination at both the official and popular levels. This social and cultural fact conceives of indigenous peoples as always and invariably frail in the face of a corrosive European or Western technological superiority, which consequently spells elimination and or assimilation for indigenous peoples. While certainly a key component in erasing the presence of indigenous peoples and treating them as part of the figurative hall of extinct species, and I get that from an actual museum in the city of Santa Barbara, which if you go into it, it's a, it's a museum that on the one side is a hall of extinct people, of, of extinct species like grizzly bears and California condors and all of these massive animals that are now extinct. And on the other side is a hall that shows the indigenous people that are also supposedly extinct in, Cal in, in, in Santa Barbara. Um, where am I? Uh, the figurative hall of, species, of extinct species which is how California natives are still considered to this day in many corners of the state. It is also a way to reject contemporary native people when their presence is undeniable by rendering them inauthentic or illegitimate. So when native people don't dress the way or act the way or speak the way that white people want them to or expect them to, then somehow they're not Indians, okay? So in every case, it's non-native people who are defining indigenous identity uh, and, and making those judgment calls. Both processes have been evident in the work I have done as a staff ethno-historian for tribes in the San Francisco Bay Area that are not federally recognized because of how the European, excuse me, the American bureaucracy dealt with them in the early 20th century. So as an anthropologist, I've been an employee of tribes that are based here and here and down here. Um, research and writing in the service of their petitions to be officially recognized have necessarily had to both critique and come to terms with the effects of the myth of the vanishing Indian. And perhaps worse, from a professional point of view, critiquing what can only be seen as the complicit role on the part of some anthropologists in the early 20th centuries, uh, century. In other words, some anthropologists, and sometimes unintentionally, also played a role in the view that certain indigenous peoples had gone extinct. And 
that's something I can elaborate at much greater length, but let's leave it at that for, for the moment. With respect to contemporary indigenous peoples who live and struggle in California and dispensing with terms that carry their own problematic implications uh, and colonial legacies, terms such as survival, adaptation, acculturation, all of which again assume that indigenous peoples and their, their, their systems of life are, are frail and can be corroded very easily. The fact remains, even though the indigenous peoples are there, that the landscape of California is unalterably changed. And everyone knows this, everywhere in the world. California is and will remain uh, a place where agriculture has been one of the two central determinants, along with urbanization of landscapes that are the context for everybody's lives there, including native peoples, in the era of climate change. Tribes that are federally recognized, among whom I have also conducted research, uh, up here uh, with the Hoopa people, Yurok people, uh, Karuk people, and where are they? Wiat people um, in that area, um, possess as part of that recognition a limited yet always significant claim to a set of resources both on their reservation lands and through federally provided social services that while in the case of the latter are certainly substandard and unsatisfactory, nevertheless significant, right? I mean, you can have substandard health care, but it's better than none, often. You can have substandard housing, but uh, being impoverished and having no housing is, is, is far worse. And it's for this reason that the groups that I work for seek federal recognition as well as the uh, 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 establishing their presence and, and the fact that they did not go extinct uh, to the general population. That's what unrecognized tribes strive to achieve uh, in their struggles for federal recognition. Among all of these groups, food and landscape figure heavily because they create the social determinants for individual and collective health. What food people eat, where it comes from the landscapes that produce the food, and the relationship to that production, the health of the people and the health of the landscape. The axis at the heart of all these co-relationships is food. So where am I time-wise? A little bit of time. Oh, let's not get there first. If that is true, the transformation of indigenous identities and the deep and complicated role of the transformation of landscapes by colonial presences and processes is not only a central feature of how foraging societies were dominated in North America and elsewhere, but also intrinsic to colonial encounters between societies that are already agricultural. So let me break that down. So right in California, here in Greenland, elsewhere in the Pacific Northwest, you have an agricultural colonial society that comes in and dominates a society in which people get their food from uh, wild plants and animals. So that's a particular kind of relationship in California. That um, relationship, uh, when the Spanish got there, was determined by the destruction of the possibility for getting food from uh, and in the ways that people used to get their food. Right. So, so after. The Spanish had been there for maybe 50 years. Even if you escaped from a mission, you couldn't get food the way you used to get food anymore because the animals weren't there anymore like that, right? And so uh, you could remain an indigenous person, of course, uh, and in many ways maintain uh, 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 all sorts of ways of, 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 of claiming that indigenous identity and of practicing that indigenous identity. But the way people got food uh, within a, a fairly short amount of time after the Spanish got there, and certainly to this day, it, it's not possible anymore. Um, people still do some salmon fishing up here in Northern California. Certainly, there's still salmon runs in the rivers of this part of the state. But can you sustain yourself for the entire year from fishing a salmon run? Very unlikely. And there were salmon runs all down the coast, here in the Bay Area, now home to 
8 million people, well, obviously there are no more salmon runs there. So the, the, the tribes I work for here, right, they're, they're not going to be getting their food from fishing. They're not going to be getting their food from gathering wild plants. So that's one set of relationships, right, that we've talked about. But what I want to talk about next is societies in which both the dominator and the dominated, the colonial power and the colonized, are already agricultural. Right? They're both agricultural. And, and that, uh, uh, that is uh, a, a struggle and a battlescape that's defined by, by uh, the issue of, I would say, modernity of one society that claims to be modern and another society which is claimed to not be modern. And this has been made abundantly clear to me in conducting research about and leading these two student field schools in the West Bank of Palestine in the last eight years. And this is the last case study that I will introduce. And I know there have been a lot of them and keeping track of them is, is a, little, a little bit much, but, but I hope the thread is, is clear. Okay, so we're going to go to a, a map now of, of, um, of the West Bank and Gaza and uh, also part of the state of Israel. So let's look at this map for a second. So uh, this is the Jordan River, right? And that's the kingdom of Jordan over there. This is the Gaza Strip. And this is the West Bank. And so what are these different areas? Some of you may know. So if, if you do, uh, it's just a review. So uh, prior to 1967, the state of Israel was just this gray area. And uh, this area they call the Gaza Strip was controlled by Egypt. And this part here they call the West Bank was controlled by the Kingdom of Jordan. And then in the 1967 war, uh, the state of Israel uh, conquered and took control of Gaza and the West Bank, and also an area in Syria called the Golan Heights that was in the re news recently, and then also the Sinai Peninsula, which was returned to Egypt in a peace treaty in 1979. In 1994, an agreement was negotiated between the State of Israel and the Palestine Liberation Organization, which created something called the Palestine Authority, or Palestinian Authority. And the West Bank was split into three areas. Most people in the United States don't know anything about this. People in Europe, I think, know a little bit more. Of course, people in the Arab world know a lot more. Um, area A, right, uh, which is actually these areas, this is area A and C, uh, excuse me, A and B. So these orange areas or, or tawny brown areas or area A and B are under the control of the Palestinian Authority. And Area C, this gray area, is under the control of the Israeli military and Israeli civil authorities. So even though this is all land, right? And by the way, this is a very small piece of land. I don't know what it is in kilometers. It's 2,500 square miles. What is that in square kilometers? I can't tell you. The whole of Palestine is 10,000 square miles. Um, in US terms, that's the state of New Jersey. It's a small state, right? So this is really kind of a little place. So this area, it looks like an archipelago, right? It looks like islands surrounded by a sea of Israeli control. So if you're living in this place or here or here or here, you have to travel across Israeli territory to get from one island of Palestinian control to another. And these areas are surrounded by fences. Um, they are not open to access. And of course, this red line here is the wall, the famous wall, the segregation wall. Some people call it the apartheid wall. The Israelis call it the separation barrier. In some places, it looks like that. That's what it looks like. And um, so it's about 30 feet tall and with a very uh, uh, fearsome barbed wire fence on top. And there are guard towers every 
250 meters. Okay? So that's what the wall looks like. In other places, it's, it's fence. Like, probably here it's fence. But all around here, it's that, it, it looks like that. It's a wall. And so this wall separates um, certainly pre-1967 Israel from the Palestinian areas. But also, as you can see, many parts of the West Bank are also behind the wall. So all of those areas that are uh, west of the wall are behind it, obviously. And interestingly, some of those places um, include Palestinian uh, populations. So there are still Palestinians behind some of the wall territory. And in some places, if you look up here, it's very complicated. You can see Palestinian areas that are surrounded on f all four sides by wall. So I have been in this place here. It's a city called Kalkilia. And basically, you can drive from this Palestinian part. You, get, you go through an Israeli part. And there's, a, there's basically a door, like a gate, if you want to get here. So these are um, the conditions of life for Palestinian people. Okay, And I'd like to comment about doing work under these conditions briefly. It requires a, a little bit of personal information, but it's important. Uh, working with and for unrecognized tribes in California clearly was possible because I support those tribes' goals. Right, I work in, in, in for those tribes in order to achieve the goals of the tribes, which are federal recognition. And that was also the case when I did work with the Nasa farmers in Pitayo, right? I didn't even know how much I was working in support of their goals. I didn't learn that till later. But certainly my idea was to make resources available to that community uh, so that it would be under their control. So uh, that's been true in California. It's been true in Colombia. And it was true in Nicaragua as well. In Palestine, that research was defined by and, and situated in the pedagogical project of developing and engaging field schools for both undergraduates and graduate students from the University of New Mexico. For me, the personal stakes were also intensified because I am the son of a Holocaust survivor from Hungary on my father's side and the grandson of refugees who left Belarus at the end of World War I. And I deploy anthropological tools to, on the one hand, document how Palestinian lives and lifeways have been erased and made illegitimate by the Israeli National Project, and on the other hand, to support Palestinian human rights and national struggle. So th it's complicated for anybody to go to Palestine, and it's complicated uh, for some people, perhaps even more so. So I'm going to talk about an activity we did in the Palestinian Field School, in the Palestine Field School. The practice of visiting sites where Palestinian villages, towns, and sacred structures once stood or still stand in ruins under occupation has become part of popular culture among many Palestinian families and communities, as well as part of their practice of political resistance. So what does this mean? Well, there's the West Bank, right? But here's pre-1967 Israel. That area that became Israel in 1948 had over 500 Palestinian villages that were evacuated or, or um, depopulated during the war, what the war of what the Israelis called the War of Independence and what the Palestinians called the Nakba, which means the disaster or the catastrophe. So there's, there's the ruins or remains of about 500 different Palestinian villages in that territory. Now, what happened to them, their fate, is curious and interesting. And part of what um, we did in the field school is to explore the fate of these settlements, or excuse me, of these villages. Um, it was our one of our central activities, and we called it the archaeology of the present. In other words, going to a place, excuse me, going to a place to detect in the present the remains of the past not by excavating, but by a kind of close observation that might tell you, well, what used to be here? Well, who used to live here, and how did they live? For the students in the field schools, we had not come to such sites to enjoy nature or 
the nation, but instead to better understand how conservation, nature, and nation are each complicit in cloaking conquest. As a class, we abandon the smooth concrete in search of cacti. In areas that had been reforested, we learned that Arab villages had existed just 60 years previously. Okay, so we went to many places in, inside of Israel, not in the West Bank, but we were also in the West Bank a lot, but we were inside Israel in this area here into forest regions, places that have been reforested over the past 60 or 70 years. And we found out that, uh, that the villagers had used cacti, prickly pear cacti, in order to mark the boundaries between their farmlands. As we walked through the thickets of pine trees, we would find those cacti. And beyond the cacti, we found abandoned wells, demolished structures, and other remnants of a life that was destroyed. We found stands of fig trees and tamarind trees and old olive trees, all the ruins of pre-1948 Palestinian agricultural production. So if you're walking in a pine forest in this region, oops, in this region, um, or up here, or down here, and all of a sudden you come upon an olive tree, that's not an accident. Or you come upon a fig tree, it's not an accident, right? Um, basically, you are in a place that was once someone's farm. As we uncovered these histories, students experienced the une uneasy dissonance of colonial environments. The conquered past had not been erased, despite attempts to plant trees on top of it. Moreover, we graphically saw how the site of one people's leisure and recreation, because, you know, people were hiking, we were hiking, people were picnicking, so it was a site of leisure and recreation could simultaneously be the site of another people's tragedy and their dispossession and the violent upheaval of their heritage. Planting pine tree forests was used to obscure the area where villagers destroyed houses had been located, along with substituting Israeli agricultural settlements and villages on lands that had been previously part of Palestinian villages. In some areas, pine forests were planted where Palestinian homes were located in the immediate past adjacent to areas that became archaeological parks designed to simultaneously rearrange and interpret antiquity. So there were excavations going on in these archaeological parks, and there was interpretive signing there that guided you towards a particular understanding of history and a particular understanding of who belonged and who did not belong in that place. In many other places, this work is engaged by planting trees with considerable economic power of their own. So I think I'll get to that. Oh, uh, here's an Israeli settlement. This is what they look like. I know some people can't imagine really um, what they might look like, but this is kind of what they look like. So these are Palestinian farms down here, and these are ruins of, of, of previous uh, village sites. And then these are very large. These are multi-dwelling. Uh, there are probably 10 uh, apartments in each one of these, and they have been created by leveling, creating leveled landscapes on a hill, hillside and then planting them. And these directly overlook uh, Palestinian uh, uh, farms that were, and in some cases, are still present. So um, here are some of those trees that I, I wanted to mention. Uh, planting trees with considerable economic power of their own, such as date palms and other cash crops. So th these are date palms, which are native to the Middle East, but not to this area particularly. And these require extensive water, and they're, they're draining the aquifer of, of the Jordan Valley. Um, uh, and, and Palestinians who live there are, are not permitted to use that water. The use of such environmental, ecological, and archaeological strategies for literally covering up the remains of Palestinian villages, and especially Palestinian farms, recreates, or better said, recapitulates the sense of what constitutes the natural environment. What is nature, according to specific concepts of nature, and who controls nature? The case of Palestine and the pedagogy we experience there obliges any transformation of landscape by farming, 
but also by projects of conservation and the protection of nature to be examined under the telescoping gaze of colonialism's effects. What trees belong where? And who makes those decisions in societies that have experienced colonialism? Societies in the midst of deciding what constitutes decolonization in a post-colonial world. And how does climate change constrain those decisions, upend their outcomes, and the power relations behind them as local worlds quickly become different? And I hope that those questions are evocative for us being here in Greenland. I think they are. What kind of trees will get planted? What kind of crops will get planted? Who will get to decide? Where will they go? Right? Um, I think are all incredibly political decisions. They're not about nature in a kind of objective or unexamined way. Let me see. I think that's the end of my slides. No, that's the credits for maps. Yeah. Uh, in conclusion, I propose that this trail of ethnographic and pedagogical projects in Central, South, and North America, and in Palestine, and in classrooms in New Mexico, connects and suggests utility for inv investigations into and about the future of agriculture in Southern Greenland in an era of extraordinary climate change. From the perspective of what I have discussed, I would like to suggest two tracks of investigation, not with, notwithstanding what I know is still a very initial understanding of Greenland and its politics and society and culture and history. Obviously, there are many other possibilities for research, and many that are underway here at the university, as I'm learning about uh, in the days that I'm here, uh, for research projects that in many ways w may have already addressed these issues or are addressing them very productively. <clears throat> First, as I have noted, it seems plain that any investigation of agriculture cannot be divorced from food that agriculture produces. Therefore, investigating possibilities for agriculture in southern Greenland would, I suggest, simultaneously be an investigation of food in Greenland, what people eat in this largest city of Greenland and in other smaller urban centers where the together the vast majority of people in the country live. Obviously, as I know already, but we'll learn more about, the historic Greenlandic diet, indeed cuisine, is not predominantly composed of farm foods or at all of farm foods. So investigating what people eat should be linked to researching how people eat now differs from what they ate in the 20th century and earlier and how those changes occurred. And moreover, research might ask what people um, would, would also ask what people might eat, what they might want to eat, and what they might consider eating in the future. A project that links agriculture's future to food's future is one that would require extensive ethnographic research and profound understandings of the locations where the Greenlandic population lives. The fact that such research would require a linguistic competency and facility that were I to live here in Greenland for 10 or 20 years, I might just begin to engage is clear to me. The long periods of time needed to attain fluency in some, is something I know well from living and working in the Spanish language in Latin America. And I'm very certain that for English speakers, Spanish is a language which is far easier to attain competency in than Greenlandic. So what I propose, if I may, is an opportunity that would bring me to Greenland to teach class or classes at the university in order to collaborate with students and a student cohort that themselves would design and develop such a project. I hope the classes I have taught about food at the University of New Mexico could provide an informed background about how to teach such a class about those topics here. In addition to a possible food and agriculture project, I would also like to suggest an agriculture and landscape project. Again, looking at the work I did in California and Palestine, I emphatically, emphasize, I emphatically emphasize, I emphatically state that agriculture constitutes and creates a substantial and permanent transformation of landscape, and that this will be true, and, 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 and importantly so, in southern Greenland 
even apart from landscape transformations triggered by climate change. Better said, while climate change will transform the landscape in southern Greenland as elsewhere in Greenland, agriculture in and of itself, wherever it becomes significant, wherever it might even become dominant, is one of the most profound levers of landscape transformation. In a democratic society such as Greenland, a society which is seeking political independence and therefore is engaged in questions of coloniality, decolonizing, and post-coloniality, what the landscape should or might or could look like in the future would seem to be a significant question. With respect to landscape and agriculture, I would seek to collaborate with students in developing research agenda, methodologies, and goals. I hope this presentation has offered useful ideas for students and others that could be explored in pedagogy and field research. And thank you very much once again for this amazing opportunity to speak with you about all of these topics this evening. Thank you. Thank you.